Over the years, From Software has gained quite the reputation in regards to their DLCs for their already stellar games. And this reputation started all the way back with the best game ever made. It's, it's this game. It's Dark Souls. Artorias of the Abyss is an incredible experience, and although it is often regarded as just a boss rush, I have really come to appreciate all the other aspects of it in terms of its place in the narrative and the environmental design. But before I talk about this stellar DLC, I have to talk about the strangest aspect of it. Actually unlocking it. The way in which you access this DLC is one of the most obtuse experiences I've seen in a game. You have to kill the Hydra in the Darkroot Basin, reload the area, go to the corner of the lake and fight the Piss Golem, talk to Dusk of Ulusil, get the broken pendant from the Duke's archives, and then come back to the basin. This doesn't sound so bad, it seems to only involve two locations after all, but for the average playthrough, these steps are really spread out, and it's not going to be naturally done like this. The Hydra is a bit of a challenge for low levels, so there's a decent chance that the player might not beat it given the fact that they are low level. On top of that, the broken pendant is only dropped by the Golem in the archives after you've rescued Dusk from the Golem. So if someone doesn't follow this very narrow order of events, and they just kill the Duke's Archives Golem and think it doesn't drop anything, it will be kind of difficult for them to intuitively figure out that they need to go back to the Golem once they've rescued Dusk. Now granted, this whole process has always been really well documented on the internet, but without an internet guide, I have a feeling that finding this DLC blind would be a total nightmare. The game does a good job of showing a connection between Artorius and Darkroot with his grave being there. The main issue arises in just this order of events being so messy. With that little bit of nonsense out of the way, I can finally talk about the actual DLC. I love the portal in the alcove. The way it seems to fold in on itself no matter what way you look at it is such a trippy visual effect. Everything about this introduction is just teeming with intrigue. I love how right out of the gate, the first thing that Dark Souls throws at you is the Sanctuary Guardian. This not only prepares you for the main focus of the DLC being bosses, but also showcases how much more tricky these fights are going to be. The Guardian is faster than just about every fight in the base game, and you don't have much room to breathe. Its health is pretty low, but you only have a few opportunities to strike between the Guardian's combo chain. This balance between long combo chains and small amounts of health really sets this up to be kind of like a training exercise of sorts. Well, look at this one. There is never a dull moment in this DLC. One moment you're fighting a lion angel, and then the next moment you're getting caught up on the story through the help of a mushroom. Elizabeth is Princess Dusk's godmother and basically tells us that Artorius is getting his ass kicked and we gotta step in. Knight Artorius came to stop this, but such a hero has nary a murmur of dark. Without doubt he will be swallowed by the abyss, overcome by its utter blackness. I have to admit, I never really took much time to actually take in this sanctuary. I feel like most of the time we all get caught up in the spectacle of this DLC's boss fights, but I've come to realize that, just like with the base game, they put just as much care into the DLC's environments as well. It's so serene. I even went back to the Sanctuary Guardian's arena and heard some wildlife noises I'd never noticed before. This one I especially found weird, and I genuinely don't have a clue what it's supposed to be. If there's any wildlife experts out there, I'd love to know the origin of this sound. The Royal Wood is an area I've never really put much thought into. 
I usually just beeline through it to unlock the shortcut and avoid as many enemies as possible. But this time around I decided not to do that and I really came to appreciate this segment. It has this great atmosphere with this mist and I absolutely love the design of the stone guardians here. They have a lot more natural colors compared to their present day counterparts. This natural color choice gives them a more woodland creature vibe if that makes sense. These twig guys are great too. Their attacks can be a bit obnoxious to deal with sometimes, but their slapstick nature more than makes up for it. They get so exhausted and they trip over all over the place, it's just great. The amount of enemies has always overwhelmed me, leading me to just run through the area as I mentioned before, but I've come to realize how much of an intense challenge this offers. On my successful attempt I ran out of flasks, so I had to use Divine Blessings and Humanity to make it through. I love this jump scare with Calamite so much. I love that it's not like hostile or anything, it's just a moment where you get to see this menacing design he has. This area is Darkroot Garden in the past if you couldn't tell or if you somehow haven't heard that before. Despite the fact that they are basically reusing level geometry, this DLC takes great care in making the first half of the DLC feel very fresh. Your starting point in the woods is much different than how you would see it in the base game, and also, there's a lot of changes to the overall navigation, where the bridge with the two buildings is completely gone, forcing you to go down a different path. And just visually it offers something fresh. It's not just the fact that this is a younger Darkroot Garden, this is also around the time shortly after Gwyn reignited the first flame, so the world hasn't completely gone to shit yet. I love the color of the sky, it's such a beautiful shade of yellow. Oftentimes, the sun is always blaring in the base game, and it almost seems shapeless in the present day. But here, in the past, it has clear form, and we can make it out. Everything seems to be somewhat under control. I'm starting to sound like Solaire with all this sun talk. There are so many items to find in the woods, it's really satisfying to actually explore it in its entirety for once and discover all the trinkets. I also noticed how even though this area is pretty linear in design, you get some agency with your navigation. Like for instance here, you can completely dodge all these guys guarding the magical elevator. I think this example is especially great because these assholes are the most obnoxious enemy placement in the DLC and it's just horrible. Hmm. Ah, let me guess. Snatched by a shadowy limb and dragged off to the past? Yes, of course. Exactly what happened to me. We are both strangers in this strange land. But at least now there are two of us. This Bloodborne reject is a real drag, man. I spent the last few minutes talking about how beautiful this area is, and all this guy can do is be a cynic and sell overpriced wares. Long ago, I had another visitor, a human like thine self, from a far away time. Only he was dreadfully odious, and I'm afraid that he is still amongst us. He wore a hat and a long black coat. Unlocking this shortcut is such a relief. Actually playing through the area properly made it all the more satisfying to unlock. Even though this DLC exists in its own self-contained space, Fragments of what makes Dark Souls' world design so great remain in these magic elevator shortcuts. They are always satisfying to unlock no matter how many times I play through this DLC. Part of that is owed to that blissful sound they make too. Just... it's peak, man. Anyway, time for the DLC's namesake. This cutscene has some pretty interesting cut dialogue for Artorias that I think is worth sharing.
people wonder why they would cut this dialogue, but I honestly think I get why they cut it. You can pick up on a lot of Artorius's character just from the way people talk about him. We've heard nothing but praise for him, and then you finally see him, and he's just monstrous, and it just doesn't seem right. It also seems like it isn't really entirely himself. His face is completely obscured to us. Cutting this dialogue allows for speculation, and it also shows that From Software trusts the audience to assess Artorius on their own. This is a man of legend. It would be weird to have everything about him made clear to us. People are more complicated than that. The fight itself is one of the best in the game. I don't think it's necessarily the hardest fight, but it's just such a blast. A lot of the fan favorite boss fights in these games take a lot of characteristics from player behavior, and Artorius is who I really think started this trend in From Software. He does have a few special moves under his belt, but his overall behavior is very much in line with the player movement. His attacks chain, but are limited to about 3 hit combos. I mean look, he even spams dodge to get away from you so he can recover. I don't think this fight is particularly hard now that I've played the game so many times, but every now and again he still finds a way to put me in my place. Choking in this fight crushes you so much because it never feels like bullshit. You just suck at the game. Loser. Failing to knock him out of his buff is especially soul crushing because you get knocked out by his iconic Artorius blast. The music here is bleak too, it's kind of carrying on with how the cutscene was. Artorius is lost. Whatever he was is gone now. The only way to do him justice is to continue his legacy and put him to rest. The somber nature of this DLC story really starts to set in after defeating Artorius. I spent like three minutes just taking in the silence of this arena after the fight. I love the dust blowing in the wind. Some real state-of-the-art technology on display. After defeating Artorius, you unlock the Battle of Stoicism, an optional PvP arena. I was playing offline at the time, but even if I was online, I doubt I would be able to find a game since most people just stick to the normal multiplayer interactions. But I can still show it off by using a trick I learned online. I had never actually done this game mode before, so it was really cool to actually pull this off and see what it was like. Exploring this barren arena feels so bizarre. This is a truly abandoned place. You, is that not the soul of the man who fell on this spot? He was a dear. Karan was among Gwyn's four knights alongside Artorius. She was obviously really close to him and she asks us if we are willing to give her his soul. His soul lets us make a cool sword with a unique moveset, but it also would feel wrong to deny a loved one something so important. Like, no, we, we used, uh, we used your, uh, husband's ashes to, uh, to make a WMD. Sorry. She disappears after this interaction, but if you go to Artorius's new grave, you can find a body with her ring on it. She always remained close to him. I got jump scared when I looked up while sitting at this bonfire. I thought that statue was some creepypasta cryptid and uh, it was gonna start bleeding hyper-realistic blood or something. Ulusil has the most unsettling soundscape in the game. There is this oppressive droning sound, but then also the occasional screams of a girl, which might be Dusk screaming all the way from the bottom of the abyss. The abyss inflicted a madness on the people of this city, and that madness distorted their physical shape. They hardly look human at all now. They contort in all sorts of bizarre ways, and the only real emotion they seem to express outside of misery is sadistic joy. This illusory wall doesn't just break from hitting it, and you need to light it up instead. I had never noticed this ominous pulsing sound it makes, and it really caught me off guard.
We'll need this pendant for later for the fight against Manus. I love this invasion with Chester because the way he spawns behind you really makes this feel like an ambush. I've always been envious of the exclusive moveset he has too. He has a really interesting roll animation, has a unique projectile that he throws, and also might even know some gun fu. I love how after you beat him, he just becomes even ruder. Well, you've quite the nerve. I've had enough of you. He's all talk though, he never invades you again after this. We got this key, so we're gonna put this Descent into the Dark on hold. Goth the Blind Giant is one of the coolest dudes in the Dark Souls trilogy. And even with his prowess, he is still a really chill guy. He warns us about Calamy, and for good reason. On a first playthrough, I think it's really cool that you have to have this moment where you realize you can't take on Calamy, but on repeat playthroughs it does come off a bit clunky. That doesn't matter though because you get to experience this incredible cutscene. Now watch and see how Goth hunts dragons. Now I can face Calamy as long as I get past this gauntlet of annoying From Software certified dogs. Calamy is an excellent dragon fight in a game littered with incredibly clunky and obnoxious dragon fights. He really is the real deal. He's got this great spectacle to him, his design is great, and the fight is actually fun to play for the most part. It makes sense that dragons would get so much lamer after the coolest of their kind is slayed. I love how frantic this fight feels. He hops and dashes all over the canyon and makes for an intimidating duel. His black flame is such a bonkers visual and he also calls upon the power of tinnitus to make you weak. He has easily the most obnoxious tail weapon to try and collect. I've managed to get it on one of my characters, but I couldn't even bother with it here because there are like two short openings where you can actually strike his tail. It's such an achievement that this DLC contains both an incredible sword duel and a great beast fight. After defeating Calamy, Goff congratulates us and reminisces on the good old days. He tells us about Koff's hand and what happened to Ulusil too. I love that he asks about the giant blacksmith. To talk about with that blacksmith. In truth, how is the old chap, I wonder? Goff calling him old makes me think that he has to have been smithing for something like 2,000 years at this point. Can't say I blame the guy for sticking to his craft. We love to see that kind of commitment. Time to head back to Ulusil. These wizard freaks are so dangerous if you're off your game, and I just get completely filtered here. This Great Hall is such an interesting set piece because I can tell that it served as some sort of cultural landmark, but now it's completely barren and only serves as an arena for this chained prisoner. I love how the developers put this bloat head on the elevator platform to mess with any players that were hoping to just run past the chained prisoner. The chain prisoner in general just feels like a massive developer troll. He's so intimidating and doesn't even drop anything of value, and there's no big mystery to really uncover about him. He just simply is. I've got to talk about the sound design again with this prison. It works so well at building up tension. 
It's as though you are hearing echoes of the captives and guards, but all that remains is this hollow interior. It's a perfect way of setting us up for the abyss that we're about to enter. While the abyss doesn't have the same pitch black effect that the Tomb of the Giants has, it still feels just as foreboding, and that's all owed to the sound design and the way the enemies stand out in this environment. The inclusion of Alvina the cat in this DLC is so funny to me. She just meows and teleports for some reason. It's so funny. It's just, it looks so stupid. I, I really, I just wonder if the developers just didn't feel like animating her guiding the player. I really want to know what the thought process was here. The humanity phantoms are such an off-putting enemy. They just do chip damage if you touch them, and the damage increases depending on the size of the spirit. And the way they just kind of float around with no real motive behind their movement has always been a bit eerie to me. Saving Sif is bittersweet knowing that we will ultimately have to fight her. It gets even worse when you realize Artorius gave her this shield in an effort to protect her. It's time to finish his job and face the final challenge of this DLC. Manus is, without a doubt, the hardest fight in this game. He is an incredibly intimidating fight, but if you'd like, you can summon the help of Sif if you saved her. I love this bit of spectacle, and it's so cute seeing little Sif clobber Manus, but I prefer to fight Manus solo. I get my ass kicked so many times by this bastard. Getting caught in his chain attack is one of the most humiliating things a human being can experience. On one of my many runbacks to this arena, I heard something incredibly eerie. I think I figured out the source, that being the idle noise of the humanity enemies. But in that moment, it almost sounded like a music piece. It was really unsettling, and I wonder if anyone else has ever heard it this way, or if I'm alone in thinking this. Manus kept getting me over and over again. I'm usually able to get to the sorcery phase, but I always crack under the pressure. His magic rain can be so overwhelming, and I hate the way the projectiles get caught in the pendant bubble. His beat attack is probably the only move I think is total bullshit, but that just might be me coping. Eventually, though, I am able to beat Manus and save Princess Dusk. All she can do is cry. Even if this is a happy ending, there is something bitter about it all. I mean, how does someone even recover from this even after being rescued? This was supposed to be Artorius' victory, and history will remember it as such. We won't be remembered for our efforts, and our only reward is a couple mushrooms and the opportunity to fight two Sanctuary Guardians. But does it really matter that our good deed isn't recorded in history? All that really matters is that we actually did it. No one will sing thy praises, but yet thy greatness shall live on, for it shall be my purpose to remember all all thou hast done for us. I'm not trying to be all philosophical, but this DLC does offer some interesting questions. We go digging through the past and come to realize that it isn't all that it was made out to be, for better or for worse. But I guess all we can really do is just roll with it and try to make sense of where we fit into all of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.